Good morning, everyone from Santa Cruz, California. It's 8 a.m. here. Uh, there's a, a lot of um, fog outside by the Pacific Ocean, but it is my honor, my delight to be with all of you this morning. And what I thought I would do is for all of us to have a, a brief meditation, maybe a couple of minutes, and I'll time it so you can close your eyes, gently drop down to your heart, few deep breaths, and enjoy. And you may gently open your eyes. Thank you for that. And, you know, I got a gift from my housemate. And um, I'm a little goofy. I love cooking. And so um, I'm going to put on my gift. And it has my brand, Conscious Creation. So... I want to say welcome to this Friday and you're choosing to spend time here with us, with Myra, me, with all of us. And this is a satsang. This is holy company. On this Friday evening, wherever you are, or it might be early Saturday morning for you, you could have chosen to be anywhere, but you chose to be here. You chose your intention to gather here. And for that, I honor this because it, it speaks something to the power of intention, your intention that feeds into us. We are now joined. We are entangled in this field this Friday. So thank you for allowing me the humor to put my wonderful chef's hat on. <laughs> With that, I will take it off. <laughs> and, um, so the first question was, uh, where is Nisha from? Where is this British accent from? And uh, actually, my patients always ask me that. I'm a medical doctor by profession. <clears throat> and they always say, Dr. Manek, where are you from? So in the chat boxes, in Myra, you can tell me, where do you think Nisha is from? Give me a little bit of a, yeah, let's play with this. Tell me where I'm from. Where do you think All right, go ahead, jump into the chat box and see if you can guess where Nisha's from. <laughs> yeah, no one trying to, no, no, no cheating. Well, oh. paying attention. <laughs> Planet Earth. <laughs> That's another goofball. <laughs> <laughs> I would say somewhere around near Iran. Oh. Yeah, I get that a lot. Uh huh. <clears throat> Not, Not Texas. Texas. <laughs> Originally from yeah. India. Okay. <laughs> mm. What if what if I said Jambo? Ah, someone saying Pakistan. And, and she just threw out something. What if she said Jambo? Does that mean anything to anybody? <laughs> I get a lot of uh, Southern Africa too. Yeah. <laughs> Hakuna Matata. It doesn't matter. <laughs> West Africa, I love it. So I was actually born on the equator, literally zero degrees latitude, okay? So when people do, um, and, and this actually happened when I moved to Santa Cruz, uh, my current housemate said, you know, we really like you and you seem to be really uh, open and you are very um, energetic but we want to make sure we're perfect fit. So she actually asked me for my date of birth and, and place of birth. And I was saying, why, why do you need that? She did a psychic reading. I thought, hey, why not? <laughs> because whatever she does benefits me. 
So I told her I was born on the equator and I was born in a village called Okalao in Yahururu, Rift Valley of Kenya. Maybe too much information, but I was born on the equator and as children we would uh, play and there was a big rusted board which says, now you're now entering the Southern Hemisphere. And then we would jump, we would draw a line in the dirt and go south, north, south. So yeah, that, that was, I was born on the equator. So Kenya, and uh, my education took me to Scotland, uh, Glasgow, Scotland, where I did medical school. And then it is, somebody's having problems with audio, so I don't know what to do with that, but okay. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> I think the audio is good for most. So, Catherine, okay. adjust okay. any way you can. We want you with us. Yep, yep. So, I trained in medicine in London, uh, and then I jumped to California. I did rheumatology. I'm a rheumatologist in Stanford University, and that's when I joined the Mayo Clinic, Minnesota, which is where I spent most of my career. And in Minnesota, you're doing excellent conventional care. Okay, this is the optimal of the optimal at the Mayo Clinic. Very data-driven, very conventional. This causes that. Uh, when when somebody comes with a disease or symptoms, we get we get our, I'm gonna put my head back on. We look at the ingredients and we try to, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sherlock Holmes, you know, you, you, you get all of those jigsaw puzzles and try to fit the gaps in with chemistry. We do chemical analysis and we try to fix it. So um, <laughs> cooking up a good recipe for health, yeah. You know, we look at diet, we look at vitamins and we try to do chemicals, steroids, methotrexate, biologics in my case, but it only goes some of the way, only some of the way. And the biggest clue was actually what my patients were doing. They were the ones who actually one particularly brought brings to my mind where this young woman had uh, the, the blood work was just awful. Okay. And, <clears throat> and as Teresa waited in the waiting area, I'm looking at her lab work because I prepare, you know, we, we want to be prepared in, in terms of information. And she comes into my room um, and she looked marvelous, healthy happy, smiling, and it was a complete mismatch to what was I seeing on computer to the actual person in front of me. And I remember that visit when I asked her, Teresa, what do you do? <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you your lab work. She says it doesn't look right, right? Yeah. So I said, okay, it doesn't, but, but um, and I was going to do this, this, and this, but I'm not. So tell me what you do. And she says, you're going to laugh at me. And I said, why would I do that? Tell me what you do. And so she reached into her handbag and pulled out something. I'm gonna, I don't have that CD, but I'm going to pull something out that I'm reading right now. She pulled something out. Okay, I'm reading Padre Pio's Send Me Your Guardian Angel. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I'm reading that. And she pulled out a... a CD of guided meditation. And she says, I do this every day. And I said, wow, I took it into my hands. Guided meditation for rheumatoid arthritis. She was self-regulating herself. I didn't teach her that. She taught herself that. And then she was doing something more. She says, unless I, she rolls out her mat, she cannot do the downward dog, but she sits on her mat and for 10 minutes, she imagines herself doing that. She was doing something more. She had the intention with meditation and then she took it further with visualization for wellness. Far more powerful than anything I was going to do. In fact, that day I didn't increase her steroids. In fact, she wasn't in any, and I was actually ready to give her a prescription. We canceled that. I didn't increase her Imuran. She was on Imuran, which is a chemotherapy to, uh, to regulate the immune system. 
What we decided to do was get her back to clinic in four weeks. I usually do six, eight weeks, and then we get people back in. I made her visit a little sooner, and I said, don't stop what you're doing. But I sure want, I took a picture off the CD, and then Mayo Clinic now holds a whole library of guided meditation. And the one that I particularly uh, recommend, if you're interested, is work by Bella Ruth Napperstack. Bella Ruth Napperstack. And she's out of Ohio and um, has guided meditation for a whole host of conditions from anxiety, weight loss, insomnia, PTSD, okay? The Pentagon uses her work, okay? They, they send CDs with soldiers going to war. So this works. So it's like biofeedback in some ways, but this is not a placebo effect, which often people think, am I just kidding myself? No, you're not kidding yourself, okay? So I came to this area of subtle energies of the acupuncture system because I know it works through Teresa. And then I looked into it with, with a Qigong master called uh, Chun Yi Lin. Uh, he is the originator, the founder of Spring Forest Qigong. And uh, Master Lin is an amazing healer. So I started meeting with him. And um, I did his level one and two. And I can tell you, folks, I could feel things move in my body. And, you know, you can play with this energy. You can make balls between your hands very quickly, okay? You can play with the energy by just rubbing your palms. Your hands are healing. And then I could feel something. I could play and expand it, contract it, move it around. And my hands were red hot. And so this was not in my head. This was absolutely be happening with me being in the Spring Forest Qigong class. And then around this time, and this was around 2009, I was invited to write a book chapter for a major textbook in complementary medicine. And intriguingly, Brent Bauer, who's at Mayo, he's a chair of complementary medicine there, said, Nisha, you like Qigong and Tai Chi. Why don't you write a book, a, a chapter on Qigong? Not Tai Chi, but Qigong, which is a more uh, foundation, a foundational piece of Tai Chi. And I think Qigong is a more meditative form of Tai Chi, okay? You, you, you prepare yourself and then you can do movement. So Qigong is more uh, meditation, breathing, making sure your spine is stacked up, and then you move into Tai Chi, which is more of a, uh, you might say, self-defense. It has its traditions in self-defense, okay? So here I am <clears throat> looking at the randomized control trials around Qigong, and this was in 2006, seven thereabouts, and I'm invited to write this book chapter, and there was some evidence, but I wasn't happy with that. I, 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 I thought we had to go into the characteristics. What is this Qi? What, what, is, the care, what is the nature of Qi? And that's when I ran into a couple of scientists. One of them was William Tiller and Candace Perch. She talks about hormones and how they regulate the emotions and the nervous system, something like that. And uh, forgive me, it was a long time ago that I read Candace's work, but what, what enlivened me was Tiller. Tiller said things in his papers that I did not understand. I couldn't understand his equations. I couldn't understand SU1 and U1 gauge. He talked about symmetries, symmetries. Symmetries are absolutely primary in the laws of nature, okay? And I talk a little bit about this in pillar number five of Bridging Science and Spirit, because once you know symmetries, you unlock a whole set of mathematics. A whole set of mathematics opens up, and then we can go and experiment. So sometimes theory comes before you look at what theory is predicting, and then with experiment, you go and look for it. Okay, so Tiller had some genius. And not only was he um, a material scientist, he understands materials deeply. He knows the molecular underpinnings, he knows how to create new materials, um, but he also was the expert in the world about crystals. And where was symmetry first applied? 
the group theory of symmetry was of, of, of uh, science was crystals. Group theory of crystals, okay? So salt crystals, diamonds. So Tiller came with his expertise of crystal knowledge and material science, but he had this other piece. This was his other genius. Now, he doesn't quite say it in his papers, but it was coming close, and that was intention. Intention, intentionality. Intention in his world is a piece of consciousness. Consciousness does things operationally with creation. Intention is your way of creating information or something physical, okay? Information is not just digital. It's actually all around us. Even as I talk to you, this book, this mouse, this pen, all of this was in somebody's imagination. Then they forged that invisible into something tangible. Even as I speak to you, this language is going into physical things, sound waves, electromagnetism that travels and it uh, is decoded and now you can hear me. And it's impinging, physical sound waves are impinging on your eardrums and you decode it as things that you recognize in English. Okay, it's just a symbol, but information is physical, all right? So, and this took me a while to, to get, really took me a while to get because to me, energy is everything and i used to say that energy is everything energy moves things energy right i was saying subtle energies tell her tell me about energy medicine and so my first um meeting thursday meeting with him in his home in scottsdale he says nisha you know something about yeah well oh, you practice chemistry you practice chemical medicine i said yep 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 I get it, I get it. It's too limited. I need to go into energy medicine, he says. And you know something about that, too. You're getting your awakening to that, but I want us to go into information medicine. And I said, what is that? What is that? What is that? And he says, we will develop this. This is where I think you use your communication, your medical knowledge, because medicine is stuck in chemistry. And we have to get them unstuck to newer possibilities. And it won't come from biochemistry. It has to come from information. Information is the irreducible unit of our universe. It is quantum. It is macroscopic. It is everything. It is all around you. So one thing I invite you to do when we come off of this call is to think of information in its various aspects, even emotions. Feelings are informational. Certain information is disturbing. When I saw the bomb blast in Beirut, this wasn't bomb blast. I knew it, it was an explosion. That's different. And I said, wow. And I actually watched the news between patients. I do telemedicine. And between patients, I would go and log on and see what's going on there. Disturbing. That information is horrifying and brings a sense of, uh, you know, pain. Actually, I feel pain. When I look at the bloody people on the streets and Macron is in there, you know, he's visiting France, uh, sorry, he's visiting Beirut, a sense of pain. And actually there is, I actually felt, I, I went into my room and cried a bit, actually. I just, it, it, it affects me deeply to, to have that because we are part of humanity. And you say a little prayer that may all be in peace. Because in the greater sense, there's perfection in the universe. There's things that unfold. I do not know the context of it. But the content is very real. I see it. And that information affects me. But what, I, what do I do with that information is entirely up to me. I can go in variety of places. And so with my consciousness, I make a decision, I make an intention, and for me, it was a prayerful healing, actually for myself. And that is self-preservation in a sense is actually also very powerful. It's a gift. It's a gift that may all be, be healed. Now, I'm going to just take a pause here so that we, I, I, you know, I could keep talking and talking and talking. So I will just pause for a moment so that we can also come back to questions 
and that I don't grab all the time and sound bites. So I'll just I'll just pause here for a moment. Myra. Yes. Uh, you know, you took us into how do we apply what we have, the tools we have, the understanding, the realization we have in these disruptive times with a sense of the universal. And one of the questions that came in speaking of questions came from uh, Stephen. It's one of those big, you know, tent questions. But I think if you're okay, um, I want to be sure that we go a little bit more into intention so that we we set that groundwork and because the book takes us there and uh and there are many ways that you got into that ground with uh with tiller yes and i think what's what's really helpful for those gathered to know and understand is that many who have done great works have had a connection to that which is larger than themselves. And Tiller was one of those, is one yes. of those. And of those. part of your story in getting to know Tiller was around the, for the requirement he laid before you to work with him. And I really would love for you to speak about that because this is the way we need to move in our world. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just say a little bit more um uh about that because we are now in you and i in our eighth year anniversary <laughs> we began our conversations wow. around the paper you and dr tiller wrote on the power of the buddha relics in july of 2012 and you very quickly in an email i sent to you about this accepted the uh, uh invitation to come on my radio show and we were with Tiller, the three of us, in a conversation on Gaia Field Radio in August of 2012. And yes. some on this call heard that and eventually met you in Washington, D.C. when you came uh, to be with us, to talk with us, and uh, while the Buddha Relic Tour was in town. So we some have some history, and yet the most important elements of what you've written about You've written in a time that Tiller's work is made more accessible through your writing. And that's the power of now is that, yes, we're going through a difficult time, but if you really notice, we're being prepared for living through these times and being a part of an evolution of life here. And so that's really with me in this satsang space that you created here today. Yes. Um, so I, 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 I grabbed an image from the book that I'd like to put forward. It's in the hard copy. It's on page 166. Let me go to that. And on the way of getting there, maybe we'll show them a few other images really quick. Oh, yes. Yes. Right? Um, because <clears throat> here you are. <laughs> Because there is, of course, a link to India and that place you were born on zero degrees, Ecuador, equator of the equator. Uh, no, Kenya. Kenya. This, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. This picture, my friends, is taken in Madhavpur. Madhav. Madhav is a name for Lord Krishna. And Madhavpur is very special because Lord Krishna abducted a princess, Rukmini. And he runs away to this village on the Arabian Sea. It's, it's a coastal town. And he marries her. And you can see this in, in today's world. You can go to the actual place where uh, Krishna takes rounds with Rukmini, Princess Rukmini, and he marries her. So Madhavpur is very special in India. Now, this place is the hermitage of Swami Ram Dulare. Swami Ram Dulare is enlightened master. This space is so powerful. When I go there, one is, or you know, that symmetry, you're in our space immediately. 
and the mind is silent. There is no need. You simply are. And so it is such a gift that before the pandemic, I did very consciously, I didn't know the pandemic was coming, but I took a trip to India to go and visit this ashram. And this is uh, the lovely caretaker. And she used to also take care of Vimala Tucker. Vimala is my teacher. Vimala passed away. And Vimala is like female Krishna. Okay. She uh, has spoken widely on the Gita. And she actually uh, formed this ashram to honor Swami Ram Dulare. So they're both entities, Swami Ram Dulare and Vimala Ji, who are here. What I did was I took about 15 of Tiller devices with me. This is a picture of the inner sanctuary of Virpur. Virpur is another town in Gujarat. Virpur is the site of Sri Jalaram Baba. He was a, a, a saint in Gujarat and he was like a, uh, Hanuman, Hanuman and Sri Ram. Sri Ram and Hanuman are very close. They are like inseparable friends, okay? And Jalaram Bapa was so devoted to Ram, Ram Bhagwan, he became enlightened. And when you go to Virpur, this space, and I'm getting all showers of goosebumps as I speak, it's so funny. I never used to believe people when they say, I get goosebumps when I talk, but I'm getting them all the time now. So when you go to this place in Virpur, it is highly, highly conditioned. And these folks have passed away 200 years ago. So something of the essence of their consciousness never dies. It's indestructible. And it's a gift. Okay, so when you go to Virpur, it feeds thousands of people. Many, many villagers and farmers come every lunchtime and every evening for their lunch and evening meals. Prasad, it is sanctified food. And you know, it's amazing that no matter how many people come, it's like the Master Jesus' story of the fish and loaves, that it multiplies, multiplies. It never runs out. And this, this ashram does not take donations, and yet they feed thousands and thousands of people. How is this possible? But when you're dealing with the divinity, <laughs> this is infinite love. You know, this is uh, this is tangible. You can see this in front of us. And and Baba, when he was alive, you know, he would have a basket, and inside would be gantia, which is chickpea flour noodles, and jalebi, which is a sweet. And he would cover it with a um, uh, like a scarf and would feed all the people, all the people who would come through his village, Virpur, and even the, the Muslim moguls, they would come to Baba for advice. He used to heal people from diseases, um, and it is said, and these are contemporary, 200 years ago, many, many miracles, so many that impossible books have been written about this. But he also raised people from the dead, you know, <laughs> if, they're, if it's not their time, they will come home, they will come back in this physical presence. So Jalaram Bapa is also very dear to my family. So I, so I went to Virpur with my...